Hello to all of you at Sobel Christian Fellowship. My name is Luke Kipfer, and I'm so excited for the privilege to be with you the morning of Saturday, September 23. Now, as believers in the greatest news ever proclaimed, we are called to lead, love, and serve like Jesus. In a post-Christian world where many people might write us off as old-fashioned and religious, wouldn't it be great if the character, behavior, and joy emanating from our lives presented such a compelling message that they would want to know and experience Jesus? And wouldn't you love to discover how we can take discipleship to a whole new level? How we can bring about lasting and transformative change in our lives and of those we love? So come on out at 8.30 in the morning on September 23rd to discover how Jesus led himself before he led others. How he went deep with the few to impact the many. And how we can change the world through the discipleship framework of being knowing and doing. I look forward to seeing you there. I hope that you're doing these take-home studies. Uh, there, there's videos that go along with it. I know many of you are because I'm hearing your stories already. And, and several people are, are taking these, which man, there's, there's some questions here and you could do it really lightly and shallowly, but many of you are taking them and going really deep in fantastic conversation. And uh, thank you. And I, I want to ask you to take these seriously. Jump in with both feet. Uh, if you haven't been doing it, they are all available. This is the fourth one this week. Uh, there, if you go to the Welcome Center, they're all there. The DVDs are there. The videos are there. All the, all the videos are online if you want to do that. Um, and do these together in groups. Take them seriously and jump in. These are very, very good things. As we dig into this together, I believe wholeheartedly that we will be given by God one heart and one spirit. As we honestly seek him, as we honestly seek his heart and his plan, his will, his desire, his agenda, and follow what he says, I believe God will speak. And I, be, I believe that he will lead. What I don't believe is that God will give us mixed messages. If we all seek God, he's not going to say one thing to somebody and a different message to somebody else. Unless that's how you ought to respond to what he's asking us to do. So if some people are hearing this and other people are hearing this from God, then one of us isn't listening and my challenge to all of us is, together, will we seek his heart wholeheartedly? Will we seek his plan, his will, his desire, his agenda and follow as he speaks and leads? This is a call to seek him in a new way, invigorated, intensified, a life of faith, of trust, of surrender, of consecration, of stewardship. This is our campaign. And as many of you know, the uh, home visits have started. And, and I want to stop quickly and, and clear up some confusion. Because many of you have been part of campaigns like this before and part of the, the home visiting let me be very, very clear. These visits have nothing to do with money or pledges. And I know many of you have been part of these experiences before, even in this church a number of years ago. These visits are about ministry, community, and prayer. Amen. Not money and pledges. This is the life of our church. The community, the support, the prayer. And, and these things, these visits and the discussion and the prayer will build towards our 24-hour prayer vigil. And that will be a significant event in our church. And so I'm asking you to sign up. As Stephanie said, there's a huge poster on their wall back there with lots of time slots. Uh, will you be part of that? Let me say too, thank you because many of you are engaged already in a 24-hour prayer uh, opportunity that our prayer ministry has already been setting up for a number of weeks. And many of you have uh, signed up on their schedule to pray for a half hour throughout the day. And there, we have several people who are committing uh, to pray around the clock here for our church and for each other. Way to go. So in October... When this campaign gets around to asking for commitments and for financial contributions and pledges, I've said this before. 
with all honesty, do not give a penny that God doesn't ask you to give. As a matter of fact, week in and week out, every month, every week, don't give a penny that God doesn't ask you to give. But understand the implications of that because what I'm saying though is if God is asking you, if God is moving you to give, then we must obey. But it's not someone making an appeal. I'm asking us through this entire campaign to dig in in the spiritual journey, to seek God with new vigor and to walk in the way of Jesus. Is that fair? Let's dig in. Jeff, do you have a Bible with you? I hope you do. If you don't have them with you, uh, there are a lot of them at the rack on the back. I'd love for you to have one with you in your hands as we walk through this. We're going to weave our way through a number of scriptures this morning uh, to arrive at one point. And uh, so follow along, dig in with me as we go. Let's pray before we head there. Our Father in heaven, you are good. You are sovereign. You are the high king of heaven. And God, we know with all of our hearts that you are here and that you are present with us. And so we ask you, Holy Spirit, to have your way. Will you move this morning? Will you speak this morning? That we might hear your voice, not my voice. That as we dig into your word, that you would make it come alive, that we would have understanding. But more than that, that you would speak to each of us individually as how we ought to respond to you. So God, have your way here this morning. We come with open ears, with open minds, with open hearts, with great anticipation of of your visit with us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, will you turn to the book of Daniel? Daniel chapter 1. I want to jump through the first five or six chapters here relatively quickly. These are all pretty familiar stories. If you've been around church for any length of time, you'll know these stories. And these are fascinating, almost unbelievable stories of God's working in people's lives. And if you start in Daniel chapter 1. Right away we see the people of of God, the people of Israel have been um, exiled. They're in Babylon, pulled away from their own homes, their land destroyed. They're living in Babylon. And here Nebuchadnezzar the king, if you look in verse 4, chapter 1, he collects the youth, the best of the best. It says, uh, the, the youth of nobility, without blemish, of good appearance, skillful in wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So he collects the best of the best young leaders. He brings them into the palace. He puts them in the best school, the best education. In verse 5, the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and the wine that he drank. So he set aside for them the best of everything, and he was pouring into these young leaders. But what we see here, verse 8, that Daniel, in his heart, in his conviction in relationship with God, felt that this food and this drink that the king was providing would defile him in his walk with God. Now, we don't know, because there's no other details here, we don't know if the food that the king was offering him was contrary to the Old Testament law. That could be. There was a lot of laws about what to eat and what not to eat. We don't know if this was just Daniel's personal convictions. We don't know if it was based on the principle of the whole thing or given other certain... We don't know any of that. Here's what we do know. That he felt that if he ate this and drank this, that it would be a defilement between him and God. We do see that. And so come to verse 12, and he asks permission to only eat vegetables and to drink water. Now let me say right now that this is not biblical instruction for us to be vegetarians. I have heard that before. Let me tell you, this isn't about vegetables or meat. This is about what is between me and God. 
And in Daniel's perspective, whatever the reasons here, he felt as if this would betray his God. He was saying, what defiles? When I think about that. That's a deeper question than it seems. What is it that defiles us? Do we say no to what God says don't? If, these, if we know things will mess us up, if there's things that will stand in between me and God, if they will steal our energy and steal our focus away from God, he's saying, I won't. Daniel could have made all kinds of excuses here. They all had great excuses. This is good. This is the best of the best. Maybe they could have said, look at what God is providing, right? What a blessing. But in Daniel's mind, in God's economy, this was defiling. So for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego here, to eat or to not eat was a commitment of living according to God's way without compromise. So go fast forward here a little bit to chapter 3. Sometime later, Nebuchadnezzar is still the king. And in chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar makes an image of gold. This huge, huge statue... And in verse 11, the declaration is made that whoever does not fall down and worship this will be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. Well, guess what happens? Here's these fine young men again. In this case, it talks about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And in verse 12, these men, O king, these young leaders you have chosen, they do not serve your God and worship your golden image. And Nebuchadnezzar with, was furious with rage. Throws them into the furnace. And we know the story. God shows up. Miraculously takes care of them. Protects them. They come back out of the furnace. And look at what it says in verse 30. After this whole thing, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Even with the unknown, even with the fear even with the uncertainty, even with their life on the line, they made conscious decisions to choose what is right in God's eyes. Even if it puts everything in jeopardy. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to refuse to bend their knee in worship was a commitment to live along the way of God without compromise. So I think what things are in our lives daily, maybe not a giant gold statue, but what things are in our lives every day that we surrender to? What are things that we bow down to? Maybe whether we want to or not, but they steal our focus away. They're things that we know are not the way of God, but we feel like we have no other options. So go fast forward to Daniel chapter 6 now. Daniel, again, is in high leadership in Babylon. And he's outlasted two kings. Because here Darius is king, and this is two kings since Nebuchadnezzar. And he's still in this leadership position. And in, in, in verses 1 to 3, Darius the king sets up satraps, or satraps, which are simply uh, provincial governors. He sets up 120 provincial governors to govern, and then all of these answer to Daniel. And it says that he planned to set up the entire kingdom with Daniel second in charge. So, verse 4 and 5 give us the reason for that. Because Daniel was a man where they found no ground for complaining, no fault. He was faithful. There was no errors or fault was found in him. What a stellar young leader. So he rises up. And then others are jealous. And so in verses 6 to 9, these others come to the king and call him to make a decree or a document that says for the next 30 days, no one in the kingdom is allowed to beseech or make petition of anyone else or any other god for the next 30 days other than King Darius. Well, that sounds like a good idea if you're the king, right? That's a lot of attention on me. So he goes ahead and does that. In verse 10, Daniel knows about it. And what does he do? Daniel had a practice 
of praying several times a day in the middle of his front window. Well, he had all kinds of excuses here. He knows the law. He knows his position. He knows what's at risk and what's at jeopardy. And he could have very easily say, okay, for the next 30 days, I'll pray in my bedroom. Not compromising my prayer at all. But guess what he does? He goes right back to the middle of the living room in the front of the window where everybody can see him. Talk about boldness. Even with all the excuses, he doesn't. He's thrown to his death in the, in the den of lions. And again, we know the story how God miraculously protected him. He's pulled back out and look at verse 26. Chapter 6, verse 26. King Darius makes a new decree. Here he says, I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and miracles and wonders. In heaven and on earth, he who saved Daniel from the power of lions. So look at verse 28. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. So two more kings. So here Daniel has actually lasted in leadership through five kingdoms. Daniel prospered because Daniel made a commitment to live according to God's way without compromise. Even though his life was at risk, everything was at risk, he committed to choose what was right. Even when my mind can come up with a million reasons why I shouldn't. We're good at that, aren't we? To listen to God and do what he says. So why am I reminding you of these stories? The way of Jesus calls for an undying, unwavering commitment. No halfway in or out. No casual Christianity. We sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Well, it makes me think of Lot's wife. As God is destroying Sodom and Gomorrah and, and has allowed for the rescue of Lot's family and, and the instruction is to run from the cities and not look back. And you know the story. As they go, his wife turns back and looks at the city and, and turns instantly into a pillar of salt. Why? Because she looked back, it says. Well, that word there that in Hebrew for look back in that sense is the word to regard. It's not that she just turned around to see what was happening. She was actually following what God was asking. I'm leaving the city and we're bolting for the hills. They were obeying God. She turned around with longing in her heart. If I really trust, if I really trust anything, then I can commit wholeheartedly. If I only half trust, I'm only going to half trust, half commit at best. Those two things are so closely tied together. Will you go to Luke chapter 14? This is a very difficult passage. It's a teaching of Jesus himself. And this is one of those passages that, that we, we often really struggle with, but it's so crystal clear. Luke chapter 14, I want to read 25 to 35. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yet even, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise... When he's laid a foundation, he's not able to finish. All who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not first sit down and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? 
And if not, well, the other is a great way off. He sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is of no use for either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Would you be willing to distance yourself from your family for the sake of Christ? That's a loaded statement. Because we could read into that a lot of different ways. Are we willing to put the value of following Jesus way out in front of the value of my relationships? Wow. Then you can't be my disciple, he says. But a really interesting time over the last year as we've continued to try to find uh, a youth pastor. Uh, I've had so many conversations and the thing I'm hearing more and more and more and more than anything else from great young candidates is they're not willing to move away from their parents and their grandparents and their friends. So where does that come from? To say, God, I'm going to be in your ministry. I'll go where you want me to go. I'm going to serve you no matter what you want me to do as long as it's within 30 minutes of my house. That doesn't make sense. I don't want to hire that person. He says here, are you willing to pick up a cross and follow me to the cross? To Golgotha, outside the city, and get nails in your hands? To die with me, are you willing If not, you're in the wrong room. Jesus has got a large crowd of people here. It says here in verse 25, there's great crowds accompanying him. And I think what he's saying is, some of you ought not be here. Because you're only half here. If Jesus was here and then he was going out the door saying, come on, follow me. And then he stops and turns back and says, I'm going out there. If you want to follow me, You might never see your family again. Would you still follow? If Jesus is going out and he turns around and says, I'm going out there, there there might be a group right out there right now ready to kill me and us. Are you coming? He says, I'm going out there right now. What if there's a pile of crosses and we all have to pick one up and head to Golgotha. Are you following me? We'll be tortured together. He says, unless you're willing to go the whole way, you can't be my disciple. Francis Chan, in the sermon about this passage, paints this as a word picture. He says, can you imagine a soldier who enlists for battle? Goes through the basic training, gets his gun, he's got his helmet on, and it's the first day of battle, and they all run out there. And half a day later, he's running back to his commanding officer. He says, they're shooting at us. Somebody threw something and it exploded all over the place. They're trying to kill us. Okay, we laugh at that, right? Well, yeah, what did you expect? It's a battle. You got to know that before you sign up. Jesus had a huge crowd here. And maybe after he said all of this, the crowd wasn't so big. I think what he's saying here, more than anything, is could you give up everything you hold dear to follow Jesus? He's not saying, I'm asking you to give up everything. But is following him a higher value than everything else. Tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, Read this for yourselves. As we compare it with the rest of Scripture, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I die daily. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Seek first the kingdom of God. Set your mind on things above. What will it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? 
Am I reading scripture correctly? Jesus says, unless, then you don't follow. Consecration, faith, stewardship, commitment, sacrifice, service. These are the things we're focusing on in these weeks through our campaign. And the take-home studies. And now, as Ken said, the devotional material that we've added. Here it is, simplified, get this. The call is to sacrificially reroute my life for the sake of his kingdom. It's the call to live all in for Jesus. The building project, incidentally, at this time, is what has pushed us towards this. But this is way bigger than the building project. This is a call to sacrificially reroute my life for the sake of the kingdom. And let me tell you, I have never once regretted the times when I have completely yielded to God. As a matter of fact, those are the times of the most greatest life and greatest joy. And I consistently pay dearly for the times when something else gets in the way. Anyone else feel that same way? Several years ago, I think I've talked about this before, I had the opportunity to work on a number of films overseas. Um, and I did some, and the one I really wanted to work on, I never got to, but it was a film through northern India based on a book uh, called The God Who Answers by Fire. And it's about a young Hindu boy who is not satisfied with life and answers and religion and goes on his own quest to find answers. To make a long story short, by the end of the book, he has turned to Christ. And as he arrives back home, he, the neighboring village has heard, and they bind him and hold him while they light fire to his city and everyone in it dies, including his family. Boy, if we could have a conversation of him, what does it cost to follow Jesus? In India as well, uh, there's a conference every year that's called the Persecuted Church Conference. And people from all around the world uh, who are persecuted come there and, um, and you will hear stories of those who have been beaten and wear scars, people who have run from their villages. Uh, a pastor who at 11 years old came to Christ and his dad said, you are no longer my son and threw all the stuff out in the rain. At 11 years old, the kid was on his own. The message consistently is this. Why would I give up everything if I'm only half committed? It sure is different in North America, isn't it? Because maybe it would challenge me to change how I do my job. Maybe it would mean that I might be mocked or, or pushed aside. But the question that I've asked almost every week since the beginning of August is, do I trust him with my life? In Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul says, I no longer count my life dear to me. He's living his life by someone else's agenda. <clears throat> so you think you're a businessman and your business is booming. People are lining up at the door for your services. And you say, what do you expect me to do? I can't serve in the church right now. I can't do this. I can't do this. Because God is blessing me so much in my business. Hmm. This is an opportunity that God gave me. And I'm pouring myself into it. What do you expect me to do? My question would be, are you living God's agenda for your life? So what do I do with this? This messes with everything. This campaign is the call to the spiritual journey. To live in a way trusting God like I never have before. In consecration, in faith, in stewardship, in commitment. Francis Chan, in that, that same sermon on that Sunday morning, he brought to his church and he put on the, on the stage a, an Olympic-sized balance beam, right? You all know what that looks like because it's on the screen behind me. 
Can you imagine that being here? And Francis Chan, the preacher that Sunday, gets up on the balance beam and is standing there like this and he's talking about how life is like this. And sometimes we, we are asked to step and it's wobbly and I'm unsure and I'm going to fall and balance. And he says that the Christian life is so much like that, but sometimes we just get scared because it's un- unstable and it's unfamiliar territory. And I don't want to live like that. So he sits down on the balance beam and then lays down and wraps his arms around and holds on for dear life. And this is what he says. I want my nice little family. I want to keep to myself. I want to homeschool my kids and make them wear helmets all the time. They can't go out in the sun because the sun's rays are bad. I want to hold on. I'm going to hold on to safety and I'm not going to do anything crazy for God. I just want to go to church on Sundays and teach my kids to live right. I'm not going to step out because it's too wobbly. You do this your whole life. And then when it's time to die, preferably in our sleep without any pain, you stand up and you go... What is God supposed to do with that? He's standing before the judge. What is he supposed to He's supposed to say, well done. Right? Think of the Olympics. And you're watching the Olympics and a young girl climbs up onto the balance beam, sits down, lays down, and holds on for 30 seconds. And then stands up and jumps off. And... What, are, what do you expect the judges to say? Well done, well done. You lived the safest life possible. You didn't slip, you didn't fall, you didn't waver. You were a rock of stability. That's not the life God is calling us to. That's not the way of Jesus. Matt opened our service earlier with Joshua chapter 24. Would you go there? Joshua chapter 24. This is right the very last thing in the book of Joshua as Joshua has taken over from Moses, leading the people. They've come out of Egypt. They've wandered in the desert now in the wilderness for 40 years. They've come back to the Jordan River, back to where they were 40 years ago. Now, with the opportunity and the instruction from God, cross the river, step into the battlefield, but step into my promise. And here they are, ready to step into what God is asking and what God has promised. And Joshua collects them all together and in verse 14 he says, choose today who you will serve. Draws a line in the sand. What are we going to do? He says, put away the things in your life that are bigger than God. These people had carried the gods and ideologies of Egypt for 40 years. He's drawing a line in the sand and saying, are we serving God or are we not? What are we going to do? And in verse 15, he says, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In verse 18, the people responded en masse, a whole nation of them. We will serve the Lord. We are all in total 100% commitment. Look at verse 19. You can't do this. You're not capable No, verse 21, we are all in. Hold us accountable. Are you really sure? Really? We will serve the Lord, they said. And what did they do? They stepped into the Jordan River. God showed his presence, his miraculous hand. They traveled in the midst of his mighty, visible presence. And where do they go? Into the battlefield, not into the lawn chair. This week, this afternoon, will you do some soul searching? What does commitment look like? What does commitment cost? Connect this with where we've been in the last few weeks with consecration and faith and with stewardship. The take-home study this week uh, and the the video and the, the questions will pick up right where I've left off here and consider what commitment looks like And I challenge you to take that way deeper than the surface. All centered around the verse of scripture that I think is printed on the front of your bulletins this week. Psalm 37 verse 5. Very simply, commit your way to the Lord. 
Trust in him. Those two things are not separable. We will not commit if we do not trust. If we trust half, we'll only commit half at best. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. And what's it say? And he will act. I can't wait to see what God does. As we listen to God and do what he says. Jump in with both feet. So today, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter where you're at in your relationship with God or not, no matter where you're at in relationship to our church or not, committed to Christ or not, it, there is more. There is more of God's love. There is more of his strength. There is more of his peace, of his comfort, of his blessing, of his joy than what you know right now, no matter who we are. He is a good Good Father. That's who He is. And you are loved by Him. That's who you are. That's the basis point for your identity. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Sometimes it's a big pill to swallow. But God, you have called us, you have asked us to be all in or not in. And God, like the people at the end of Joshua, we are not capable of that. And so we stand here before you in humility. God, would you give us the strength? Would you give us the ability? Would you give us the persistence. Would you give us what we need, as you have promised, to live a life that is pleasing to you, to walk the way of Jesus? God, would you do your work, Holy Spirit, in each one of us now as we respond to what you have said? Each of our responses may be very different. But your word is your word. And so God, would you not let our minds push this aside. But revisit it in our heads over and over and over. And call us, not by guilt, not by duty, but simply because of your great love. May we see your character. May we see your love and run to you. Thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that you never change. Thank you that over and over and over and over you prove this is true. God, may we let go of the things we hold on to so dearly that is doing nothing but blocking us from our focus on you. Would you point those things out to us? Call us. Call us into the way of Jesus. Amen.